Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Hope you're enjoying KubeCon so far. So yeah, welcome to the talk on zero downtime migration um, of stateful VMs in Kubernetes. It's quite a lot of words, so let's get into it. <laughs> yeah, so first of all, a little bit of me. I'm Felicitas. I work at Loop Labs, currently on like virtualization stuff. So um, I regularly post about it on social media if you guys are interested. But yeah, let's get right into, right into it. So first of all, we got to think about what VMs actually are or how they are being seen in the container age, you might say. Because a lot of people's first like uh, thought when they hear VMs isn't actually necessarily something positive. Most people would probably, like, especially if they're used to containers and Kubernetes, probably used to like having pretty high overheads, them being like fairly like resource intensive in comparison. Also them being like fairly slow to start. Usually VMs, especially cold starts, take quite a while because it's uh, to boot a whole kernel. So, um, and there's also like a lot of projects that provide these kinds of things. For example, KVM is basically what everything is built on at this point, right? It's the kernel API to do virtualization, but there are also layers of interaction on top of it. For example, we've got Livert, which is fairly common. And if you've worked, for example, with the virtual machine manager on the next desktop, you're probably used to that tech already. And of course, there's other, other solutions, such as, for example, Kibu, <coughs> that is able to um, also serve for most virtualization needs. But all of these, um, are kind of like an old solution. They've been around for quite a while, and um, while some of them are really useful, like for example KVM, some of them are slowly starting to show their age. And if containers are so great, and VMs are still around, then the question of course is why are VMs still around? Why are people still building things on virtual machines? Because the chances, even if you're running a container, if that container is gonna be running in a public cloud, probably doesn't run directly in metal, runs on a virtual machine for one reason or another. So you may be wondering, why are, is that? Why are people still using virtual machines? And in our minds, the reason for that is, is that, well, for cattle type of workloads, like something that's stateless mostly, contain, uh, containers or pods in the Kubernetes context are really, really useful. But a lot of systems are pets, and a lot of systems cannot really not be pets, like game servers, for example. Um, and for those, it's just not the right layer, the right layer of abstraction. So what we have, were asking ourselves, how would a container of stateful applications look like? What would be, what would be the um, equivalent of a container for a virtual machine, essentially? And of course, such a thing would have to be pretty fast, right? You want to be able to have very small image sizes, kind of like how well, Docker images aren't necessarily small all of the time, but you can cache layers and so on. You want to have those features. You want to have a really low overhead. Preferably, you don't want those to be um, comparable to a virtual machine. You want them to be more like containers, where it's like milliseconds or WASM modules, where it's microseconds to start them. And of course, we also want them, yeah, as we just said, a faster start. They really need to be performant. They really need to be able to like resume really quickly. Also, networking support is definitely an issue. If anyone here has worked with, for example, like Kimo, trying to just get like one port open. <laughs> into the virtual machine from the outside, especially if you're in Kubernetes or something, it's gonna be a hassle. Whereas with Docker, well, you've, or Kubernetes in this case, you've got ports, you've got <laughs> all of these abstraction layers that are super useful, but they aren't really in virtual machines today. So a good networking support would be important. And they should also be easy to build and distribute. I wanna have a Docker image of virtual machines. I wanna have a good developer primitive that you can use for it. And also, of course, we want them to be easy to scale. The biggest benefit of a stateless application is if you need more capacity, you just spin up parallel instances. For a stateful application, that approach just straight up doesn't work. Because, well, if you have state, you can't just spin up parallel things because they're going to be out of sync. So this is something that a container of stateful applications, in our minds, must be able to do. So now we're probably wondering, what if this thing existed? What could we do? So we have a few hypotheticals. For example, we could do some really cool stuff around deployment and debugging. Deploying an application in a, a stateful context here would simply mean, well, you just move the running application to a server. That's your entire deployment. You want to debug it locally? All right, you just move the server back to your local system. That's how that thing should work. That's how you'll be able to do it with containers. What about uh, what if you want to move between cloud providers? Well, with such a hypothetical construct, you'd be able to move from on-prem to like GCP, and then it turns out, okay, next day GC, um, to AWS, sorry, and it turns out next day GCP is cheaper. So you just move the container over to GCP with no downtime. That would be great. Then Azure offers a simpler rate, that's also cool. And eventually you find out, okay, energy prices have dropped, you're able to resume it on your local system. There you go, you've just moved it back. That would be a really, really cool feature to have. And similarly, so since we're talking about stateful applications here, if you were able to do stuff like, for example, and if you, I know everyone here is talking about AI, so I thought I might as well. <laughs> but for example, if you've got a very expensive, a very computationally expensive workload, like, let's say for example, an LLM or really any batch process running, and you wanna scale that up to a larger system. Well, with a stateful container system, you can just move that to a different thing without downtime. 
And this really works for any kind of application. As long as there's some network transparency involved, for example, I have a phone here that runs mainline Linux on it, and this laptop also does it. So you would be able, and both of them use the same display protocol and so on, um, you would be able to just m move a, a application from your phone to your laptop. Maybe you guys know from Avatar, there's this scene where they like move an application from your phone to like a bigger computer. You can just like take the, basically like take the app with you on your phone and resume it anywhere. Well, that would be impossible if we had such an abstraction layer, right? And this would work across, like, across different devices within some constraints, of course. But for example, if you had Linux and all of them, that would work. And of course, probably the most useful use case here in a cloud context would be to move services closer, closer to users. So like, while you have a CDN for stateless applications or edge functions or something, that doesn't work for stateful applications. You can't just move them closer to a user. And if you can, it would be extremely expensive. But with such a system, you would be able to do it. So you're probably wondering, like, this is all like, this is like science fiction movie stuff, right? Like, this would be kind of cool if it existed, but it doesn't, and it's impossible, right? So the thing is, um, we uh, actually gonna have a demo later. I want you guys to download Minecraft if you can, and this is gonna sound super random, but if you have a computer available, um, if you don't mind, just download from Minecraft.net version 1.12.2. There's gonna be a demo with it later. So um, yeah, exactly. So, but before we do that, let's get started and ask ourselves the question, why this doesn't exist yet? Like, it seems like one of those things, like, oh, it would be super useful, why doesn't it exist already? And from our understanding of it, at least, a lot of it has got to do with, like, data type advisor system. These things have been around for decades, and as such, they have uh, accumulated craft, um, and it's kind of hard to use. Live migration, in particular, the thing that allows you to move from A to B, is extremely complicated. It's a whole process you need to set up and a process you need to optimize for, or you're going to risk, um, it's also very risky. There's a risk involved in moving it. And if it breaks, you might not be able to resume it again. Also, the fast startup times. Well, VMs you need to actually stream and you need to have the entire virtual machine locally available before you're able to um, be able to resume it. So like you can't stream in, like a resin module, for example, right? Um, you're able to just like use instantiate streaming. That doesn't work for a virtual machine today. So this is definitely a bigger problem. Also, if you move from A to B, like that example where I, uh, I showed like moving from, for example, like Frankfurt to New York, well, you could do that, yeah, but your connections would break. <laughs> you'd have a different IP address. And even if you use, say, like Anycast, you'd still have that issue. You'd still have connections breaking during the migration. So it's not zero downtime. Also, packaging is a bit of a bar. It's, it's just a mess. Like, trying, there's no Docker file of uh, virtual machines at the moment, at least not in any modern re reincarnation. And it's also, like, it generally speaking doesn't integrate that well with modern orchestrators. And we're at KubeCon here, right? So um, if you want to have this, this kind of stuff instead of K Kubernetes, um, there are a few solutions like Kubert, for example, um, but most of them, they take existing technology and port it over to Kubernetes. It's not like something that was developed, uh, well, before, after Kubernetes actually existed and kind of fixed the orchestration issues for us. So you might be wondering, with one of these things, why did, how did you actually still do it? Um, so before I start with that, I'm going to give you a very short overview of existing live migration tech. So this is the thing that actually, or techniques in this case, that actually make it possible. There's two separate ones. The biggest, or the, the first one is going to be pre-copy migration. So in this case, what you do is you, um, while the VM is running on the source node, the one you're migrating from, um, you just you do it in rounds. You try to like amortize the cost of moving it by, by continuously checking for changes and just copying it over to the remote host until the difference is small enough. Then you resume it. That's one way of doing it. The other way is um, post-copy migration. And what you do here is you just stop the VM on the source out. That's going to lead to downtime, obviously, same as in the case of, uh, of uh, pre-copy migration. And you're then going to just page in the changes over the network from the remote. And as you can probably imagine, that's an extremely expensive operation, maybe less so in your own data center. But doing this between continents is going to lead to a lot of problems. So, um, but if we take a look at these two things and we kind of combine them, we get like something that more or less resembles a remote memory solution. And that's something we have ideas on how you can solve this kind of issues. Um, but there are, even if there are these options, they are typically very, very application specific. Like if you've got a live migration protocol, that's probably going to be Chemo's live migration protocol or it's going to be VMware's live migration protocol, all of which are very useful, but they aren't really adaptable to other use cases. They are also extremely data sensitive. Most of these things are designed, you move from one data center with like maybe a millisecond maximum of latency. They don't work over the public internet and they definitely don't work securely over the public internet. And also they depend on specific transports like RDMA or something. You can't just swap out the transport layer if you want to. And if you just want one extra feature in such a system, like for example, signal your application um, that uh, it's, uh, that uh, it should like do something after resuming or before suspending. It's really, really hard to do that. These protocols are not designed to be extensible by design. 
So one of these more universal approaches to remote memory, if you look at this as a remote memory issue, is user fault FD. User fault FD is a kernel API that allows you to essentially stream in um, memory as you're accessing it, kind of allowing you to do the post copy migration. And we actually even tried this out. We built an open source library for Golang. It's called user fault FD Go. Very simple bindings. And if you can probably imagine, the interface you expose such a resource as is just an I/O dot reader ads, which is probably what everyone's ever worked you just go is really we uh, work with. And um, what that does allow you to do is you can just register a um, a resource. You map it essentially to you register it on a byte slice, and then when you access an individual byte in that byte slice, you will fetch it in from the remote. So this is like one API that allows you to do it. But as you can see from this interface, this is only for reading. It's only for streaming and changes. Right. So that memory region you cannot track. This is where we, first of all, try to use file-based synchronization. Because, you know, you can represent memory as a, uh, a file with MF, for example, and you're then able to continuously pull that file for changes. You're going to be able to do basically an rsync type of protocol. And um, so what we tried, for example, was to use what Minio has developed, I, the highway hash, for example, very, very fast hashing algorithm. So you just, like, hash every single chunk, you send them to the remote, you ask for data chunks, and then you only synchronize what actually happens. This would be, this would be a way of implementing, of implementing uh, well, pre-copy migration, which would be kind of useful. Now, if we look at, um, and on the same time, Schiff, who is <laughs> our founder, is right here in the front, he was working on something completely different. He was actually working with CRFS, which is a way to access, or sorry, to stream in containers using a fuse. And this is a kind of a useful problem, but you might be wondering, like, how does this relate to using, mem doing memory migration? So Schiff came up with this thing called magic block devices. They are essentially a um, essentially a abstraction layer on top of, of NVD in this use case, which do a similar thing to CRFS, except they're able to kind of like combine both of the pre and post copy migration thing by doing background push and pull and background synchronization, which is kind of useful. And while of course we can't directly use this with energy, there's one component here that's quite interesting, which is the NBD protocol. And the NBD protocol, um, well, is conceptually very simple. But, um, yeah, so we thought, like, okay, this might be our, like, interface that we're able to do, that we're able to track changes with. So we went ahead and just built an open source NVD library. This is also open source, of course. Um, and that essentially allows you to write a, um, write a network block device in Golang without having to use any Seagull, which is quite useful. Um, and the biggest benefit, though, if I compare it to the uh, to use of the earlier, is, well, here we can actually track the writes. And <laughs> if we're able to track the writes, we were able to do both pre and post copy migration with this with this analogy, and um, yeah, the biggest problem here is that um, well, NVD is also designed for LAN, at least in most of the cases. You won't be seeing or using um, like NVD over the public internet. I mean, you can there's TLS support, but you probably aren't doing it. So the biggest question here is well, this would allow us to basically access any kind of remote resource we can represent. Um, using the network, but it's not necessarily optimized to use um, to work in R high RTT scenarios, like for example, moving between continents. So this is where Remap comes in, which is the thing I mentioned in the description of the talk. And this is our, it's like a universal resource mount and migration solution. So it tries to fix that like fragmentation in between different current ways of doing this. It's called just remote MMAP. It does more than that, but that's basically it. And actually this is part of a research paper I will be linking earlier. So this is all, all completely open. Now, what Remap does for you is actually a lot of things. First of all, it, uh, it's completely language independent. You can migrate and or mount any remote memory region with this using Rust, Golang, or JavaScript. It really doesn't matter. It's completely independent of language. And it also handles that like background pull issue I mentioned earlier. So it's able to pull it in the background. Um, and this also works, for example, during like an initialization phase. So you don't need to worry about, um, you don't need to worry about the initialization overhead of such a technology. Um, it, also, it also contains hooks you can use to extend the entire protocol with. So you're able, like that thing I mentioned, you just need to do one, one additional thing before you resume or before you respond, uh, so before you, before you suspend it. You can do this using this library. And we also have support for pull priority heuristics. Shift mentioned, uh, I mentioned that Shift worked on the MBD protocol, for example. If you had like a remote, um, if you had like a remote X4 file system, there are super blocks on there and you kind of know where those are. By providing a pull priority heuristic to remap, you're able to essentially pull those super blocks first and you're able to access it much, much more quickly than you would be by just fetching it directly on demand. We also can do workload analysis. So we're able to find out when changes happen to the memory region because we can track both reads and writes to it and then optimize for the, for the perfect point to, um, to minimize the latency of the migration, which is really quite useful. And similarly, so this supports both mounts and migrations. So what this allows us to do is we're able to use this single, this unified API 
to um, both mount a remote resource and to migrate it around. It's one library, it's a completely unified system. And also, of course, this defines network protocol, although it doesn't depend on any specific network protocol, um, it's able to use different ones. Um, but yeah, it defines some semantics for the network protocol there is. Um, and so also, it allows you to do use caching, um, and that's quite useful. So, for example, you're able to, like, if you do writes, you're able to, um, you're able to just cache them locally before you write them back, and things like that, which is quite useful. Um, and also, the migration protocol, as I mentioned, it's independent of the transport layer, but it does provide you with some semantics. For example, there are two phases during the migration there. We were able to like, recover from one of them. We are able to basically split the pulling, the pulling the chunks to the remote machine and all of that stuff like, for you. And then we have a very, very short amount where you would usually, I'm going to talk why it's not the case, but usually have downtime um, during the migration. It's like a critical phase. And this protocol is very, very simple to use. Those who have ever worked with torrents will know of this terminology, but for example, we just call it the seeder. This is the thing, if you call that seed on a resource that, we migrate, that, that you use a remap for, you're able to basically expose this to be migrated from. Then you can use a leecher to then connect to this remote resource, and finally you call finalize when it has reached a level where the, of, um, of, of local availability that you're comfortable with. So this is like an extremely generic protocol that works really for every kind of, um, kind of uh, migration scenario for any kind of resource. So you may be wondering, well, this is using NBD. This is a network block device. It's nothing to do with memory. This must be slow. Well, turns out that's actually not the case at all. We compared this heads-on to use of all of the, both of them are implemented in Go, so we think it's fair in this case. And as you can see, there's some more spread, as you could probably imagine. And this is running on zero milliseconds RTT, um, but it's fairly comparable in terms of latency. Now, where it really gets interesting is if you migrate over RTT because we are able to do the background push and pull that uh, we wouldn't be able to do with, for example, user photo because you couldn't track the writes to the memory region, so we wouldn't be able to do it. And here, we are able to essentially, by using current background pulls, to just like completely, you just don't care about the RTT, which is super useful for migration. So this is the latency story, but the throughput story is really where it shines. So this is much, much faster than user photo even though it's in user space. Like, we are able, like, user photo from our testing, was able to get like a half a gigabyte per second, which is quite fast. You need a very, very fast network link to saturate that capacity. But when it comes to migrating with, um, well, this remap solution, we're able to do like three gigabytes per second, which is really a lot faster, even though it's completely in user space and doesn't require anything um, in the kernel. So this was, was quite helpful. And of course, the same thing applies over RTT. Because you've got a caching layer, because you've got locking and everything uh, supported as part of the protocol, you're able to do really, really interesting things and you're able to much, much more gradually decrease the throughput of a migration when it's happening over a larger RTT. And of course, the writes, very similar story. You don't need to do the writes to the remote region. You can do it to the local one and sync it back uh, safely and without having to worry about concurrency issues. So instead of your writes dropping immediately down to basically zero, you're able to just keep it locally and you don't have to worry about that kind of, these kind of problems. So um, now you'd be wondering, okay, this is a very generic migration solution. Now, how do we use this for a hypervisor? And what we were trying to do, actually, was use Firecracker here. But I must stress, this is not like a Firecracker integration thing. This is very generic. This can work with Kimo. This can work with your to-do list. It doesn't really matter. You can migrate any kind of resource. We just use Firecracker because it's fairly simple. And actually, we have an open source fork of Firecracker over here um, that, uh, that you can use that actually has support for this. And the changes we needed to do to use this technology inside of Firecracker, because it's language independent, is very minimal. Essentially, it boils down to this. You just, you just resume a snapshot and pass in the map, the map shared flag. The entire change to, this, to, this, to, to Firecracker is 184 lines, and it can suddenly live migrate, which was quite, quite, quite interesting. Now, this is the Firecracker integration story, which is quite interesting. But when it comes to actually um, using this, you probably don't want to work with Firecracker directly. Rather, you want to use a you want to use a, um, an orchestration framework or, some, or, or something. And this is where Architect comes in. Architect uses these two tools and um, essentially um, orchestrates them with Remap and Firecracker. And it contains different tooling. It contains, for example, well, this is the Architect repository, of course. <laughs> it contains different tooling. For example, it contains a packager. This is, this is solving the, the, uh, the Docker file equivalent I mentioned earlier. This allows you to package a virtual machine into something that is the equivalent of an OCI image. Um, we also have a registry. This allows you to serve these images just like a Docker registry or an OCI registry would allow you to do. We also have a control plane, and this control plane is able to do some, some optimizations around RTT that, will, um, that, that, that integrates deeply with the Slack migration thing that we're able to essentially, we are only limited by light speed for these kind of solutions. So we don't need to worry about, you don't need to worry about, um, don't need to worry about integration or calling REST APIs or something. It's all very, very tightly integrated. 
And actually, the API we provide with this is extremely simple. Like this is the entire this is the entire example for the entire API. You've got one GET request, you've got one POST endpoint, and you've got one uh, delete endpoint, and that's it. That's all you need to launch any any applications virtual machine to list the ones you have running and to migrate them from A to B. So it's, this is much much easier than to have to do the manual migration thing when you need to like open up ports on the firewall. Most of the cases when you need to like um, initiate a a process of migrating it. And of course, we're at KubeCon here, right? So we've got an operator for all of this, the Kubernetes operator. And what this essentially does is it connects the um, it connects this migration technology with Kubernetes. And the way it does this is actually quite simple. So we have a CRD. It's called an instance that you can just specify a package. That's the thing that the registry serves, and a node that you would like the thing to run on. And then you can just kubectl apply, and that's running a virtual machine. You want to move it from A to B, you just change that one string, and the VM is migrated without any kind of downtime. And similarly, so if you want to delete the virtual machine or if you want to watch for events and so on, it's all very closely integrated with the way that uh, the operators work. The actual networking is a very interesting story. So for the VM network interfaces, we've built a custom, a custom net-based solution that allows you to, um, that from the VM's perspective, makes sure that when it's being migrated from A to B, there's not going to be any kind of like visible difference to it. You have the same MAC address, going to have the same, the same uh, thing, and uses network namespaces to do this. And this solves one part of the puzzle. This solves the part of the puzzle where we, um, where we move the VM and the VM needs to have the same worldview, essentially. But if we want to have the other problem, which is, well, we move from A to B, well, that's going to mean that our server is going to have a physically separate IP address. And this is where another Loop Labs project that we've been working on called Link uh, comes into play. And this is essentially a new networking primitive. And what this allows you to do is, um, well, a lot of things, but among other, but, but probably the most important thing is that it fixes this problem where you have different IP addresses. And it's not just a proxy, so, yeah. Um, so if you take a look at what it actually does, well, first of all, it's completely independent of the network topology. This works whether we're running it, migrating it from like within LAN, whether you're depending on this on your workstation, whether you have this inside of a data center. It's completely independent. It doesn't require like um, any kind of public IP on the nodes. And it also, of course, it works behind firewalls. So this fixes a lot of the issues we have around complexities with migration. The nodes also no longer require public IP address, so you can just save the IP addresses. You don't need them anymore. That's quite useful. And it also handles TLS encryption. Now, of course, it doesn't work only with TLS, but in case you're using it, that's one of the things we can do with it. And we're also able, this is probably the most important part, since this is about live migration, we're able to keep the connection as alive. So even if you're migrating, during the migration, there will not be any visible downtime to you as the user. If you're sending data, if you're like copying a file or whatever into a server, and you migrate it from A to B, that copy process continues while the VM is being migrated. So there's literally zero downtime from an end user perspective and from the VM perspective as well. So that's quite useful. And of course, similarly to the control plane, this integrates very tightly with architects. So we are able to like, just save a lot of RTTs that you would usually have with such a deployment, which keeps migration times down. And I won't be able to talk too much about Link today, um, but if you want to know about, more about this, just go to loopholabs.io and um, there's, a, there's an, a, a field, you just enter an email in and we'll be sure to contact you when it's ready. But of course, now I've explained, <laughs> at least in a very short fashion, what this is actually um, about. But that's the question, like, does this actually work? In order to show you this, I've prepared a little demo. So we're going to take Redis, or actually we're going to use a, an application to measure Redis latency. And we're going to have a we're going to have a Redis server running inside of Frankfurt, which is well across the ocean, <laughs> in this case. And what we're going to be doing is just going to be moving this uh, this uh, Redis server all the way over to New York City. And then, I mean, we're in Chicago, right? So we're just going to be moving it over to Chicago, and we can move it back if we want to. So this is a very very long distance. Like we're talking like a, like ten thousand kilometers here. This is not where you would usually be able to live migrate virtual machines. So yeah, let's uh, let's get right into it. Actually, I'll put this mic up here. It works. Hold the demo. All right. So it's a little bit hard to hold the mic while I'm, I'm doing this. Okay. So essentially, what I'm going to do here is we have this CRD, and this is actually from my graph. Let me switch over to, uh, to Redis. And this is currently running inside of Frankfurt. So if you take a look over here, you'll be able to see that uh, this is currently running on Kubernetes. Let me see. So this is currently running, and you can, as you can see, you can use the normal control watch command you're already used to. And this is running in, uh, on Frankfurt on the node Frankfurt. And these worker nodes, they are just, um, they are just the uh, just a Kubernetes node name. If you run kube control get node, you would get the same result. So if I run a little latency test over here, 
It's going to take a bit of time. I'm connected to a mobile hotspot here, by the way. So if you see this, this is this is uh, this is the latency. You need to remove like 50 milliseconds at least from this to get the actual latency. So this is currently this is currently the um, the latency we get. And again, this is using a persistent connection. We're not creating a new connection for every get and set request. We've um, we're actually just reusing the connection. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go in here, and I'm going to change this node name. And for example, now we're going to be moving into New York City. And usually this, again, is a very complicated process. But here we just could control apply it. We'll take a second. And as you can see, we're currently migrating. It's in the migrating state, right? Um, and we can jump um, over here. I'm not completely sure what's happening. Did I apply it? It's unchanged. Yeah, this is the thing when you do live demos, right? <laughs> let me just let me just uh, try and move it over to um, over to a different instance. One second, I'll try and move it to Chicago. All right, let's see whether this works. Otherwise, it's not a problem. I'll just delete the VM and start in again. One second. Okay, here we go. Now we don't have the VM anymore. Not completely sure what's going on. I'm just going to be migrating again. This is over a mobile hotspot, so I'll just uh, actually I just I, I recorded this on a video right before we started the talk, so I think I'm just going to try it over the video. Um, where is it? Right over here. This is why you always have a, a, a fallback plan in case things go wrong. <laughs> okay, so for example, over here we have a we have a virtual machine, and we just applied this this is changed. And what you will see is there will be a short latency spike, and now we actually this migrates from uh, from New York City to Frankfurt. But as you can see, there's a short latency spec, but that's it. The connection stays completely connected during the entire demo, which is quite useful. And now if we go back and we change our node name to, for example, uh, Frankfurt over here, which again is moving in the, in the other direction. And we switch back to our latency graph. It's migrating. You can see the chain. You can see the pull process all the way down there in the bottom. And as you can see, as the migration is happening, that, uh, that uh, latency is not changing whatsoever. So um, this is going to take a little bit of time. Again, we're jumping over the Atlantic Ocean here, so you're going to have some problems with network connectivity. So um, as you can see here, it's going to just resume. And there we go. Now that VM has moved physically from Chicago, in this case, all the way over to Frankfurt. And as you can see, there's of course a there, there's of course an increase in latency. Usually, of course, as I want to show you in the demo, you would do this the other way around. You would move this virtual machine from um, from, for example, Frankfurt closer to us right now. And the down, there's like again, there's like no downtime here. So this is the most important part about this. And actually here, we are now in Frankfurt. If I move it back, which we should see in just a second, you can see that there is some pull progress. And again, this is going to take like 10 seconds or something, but it's without any relevance because there's no downtime to you at this point. Just take about four seconds. I guess it's currently in flight and landing soon. So um, here we go. And now you can see the very like visible latency drop that you get. So if you move this virtual machine, I'm just going to Oh, it's already passed. And so if you do this, you're able to suddenly move your applications closer to your users. You could, for example, like if, like if, uh, if for example, the, um, the, what is it called? The, the time zone, for example, changes and, and the people are going to sleep in Europe and not over here in the US, then you would have the, you would be able to move the virtual machine closer. And actually, I'm hoping that a second demo works, but so, okay. <laughs> One second. Um, I'll be moving this back. Okay, so this is the protocol that we control, technically speaking. We, we could affect this, right? This is a register server. We're running get and set commands um, over it. What if we use something that we do not control? What if we use, for example, a Minecraft server? Well, we're going to do the same thing. Actually, I'm probably going to skip the Frankfurt server, but um, other than that, um, we can run this, this virtual machine, and we're able to move this uh, thing, even though we don't know the protocol, even though we, we don't control the protocol, we change, can't change it. We're going to move it over to New York City, and then we're just going to move it over to Chicago. So this is going to allow us for some very, very interesting, interesting use cases. Um, and again, this is uh, where I mentioned earlier, if you installed Minecraft, that would be the perfect time to join. So this is actually publicly accessible under this domain. We've got, um, we've got 20 users <laughs> maximum, so we don't accidentally DDoS our infrastructure over here. So first come, first served. But yeah, and it's important, we only picked this version because we have the server running for this specific version. Of course, this would work with any newer version as well. But in case those are interested, um, just, just feel free to join. And I'll, I'll try it on my end, and we'll see. So again, let's take a look at the actual um, instance. So over here, you can see we've got the um, we've got the uh, the Minecraft instance, the Minecraft CRD, and we're going to spin this up in New York City. So I'm just going to um, run kube control apply. All right. 
right, and I'm hoping we're going to see the connection over here. Actually, I think what's happening over here, I just, I, I lost the internet connection on this computer. Like, if I press enter here, it's not doing anything. So, Tracy, would you mind checking your hotspot, please? It's something seems to be wrong. Or I may have connected. Yeah, I connected to the McCormick Wi-Fi. So what happened here was I, I, I set up these terminals earlier. They're running Tmax. Thanks. And um, so we're just going to have to reconnect to that hotspot. One second, please. Yeah, this is the thing. When you run a public demo over, uh, over a over conference Wi-Fi, there's going to be some issues here. Um, is it loading? Perfect, perfect. So we can see some people are able to join. I'll be, I'll be hopefully under those people in just a second. Tracy, did you start it? It's not, not showing up. I'll just talk a little for a second. Okay, here we go. Dot slash phone. Oh, okay, now I'm going to have to kill these connections. One second. All right, here we go. So sorry about that. Okay, here we go. So currently we've got the virtual machine running, and now as you can see, this is on the New York City server. And if people have joined, I will also join in just a second, right over here. And um, let's see. Okay, here we go. And currently we have a few people connected, which is pretty cool. So this is working. Now, um, just feel free to play around with the server. And while this is happening, while you guys are connected to the server, I will just be moving this to New York City. Or actually to Chicago, we're already in New York City. All right, so here we go. We started it, and now you should see the pull progress. There we go. It's not pulling. And again, if I'm like just playing here, I can like destroy blocks or anything like while the migration is running. And you will actually, I can't do them here because I'm near the spawn area. But here we go. So the virtual machine just migrated. People were connected to the virtual machine. We changed things. We changed the. Um, we changed everything. We're able to connect to it back. So now we can do the same thing. And I'll jump back over to the. Um, <laughs> sorry, over here. And I'm just gonna move it back to New York City. Oops. Right, so we're just going to move it back. And what you will be able to see in... Yeah, there we go. Something's wrong with my network connection. It takes a little bit longer than usually. But here we go. So you can see that virtual machine is being migrated right now while I'm playing the server. And again, this is with an application that we do not control. So like, we can just remove blocks here. And you can see there's like no latency drops, even if you were like poking in a block, for example, to remove it. Doing that thing would work. Thanks. <laughs> Right. Thanks a lot. And as you, by the way, the, the, the numbers you see down here with the resumption times, it's actually faster than this in reality. This is including an RTT to the server and back, so it's a little bit faster than this in reality. So yeah, um, I'll be sure to do the Redis demo later if you guys are interested. Hopefully this time with a working hotspot, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so again, now that we have this compute unit, we can, we can move it around, at least assuming we have an internet connection on our workstation, I guess. We're able to do all of the things I mentioned earlier. We're able to just deploy an application by just literally physically moving it into the cloud. Again, these were different servers. There was a Bioquinix. This is like a public cloud service we can just use. And we can do the entire thing we mentioned earlier. The thing about moving between cloud providers, actually we were moving against, we were moving between cloud providers already. We were moving across the ocean with these servers. So um, yeah, that's a solved problem. If you see, the, if you see the, the rate for an AWS server, for example, change, you can just move to GCP with no issues. This, I should mention, also works with nested virtualization reasons why you should be using this maybe, but it's possible. You could even move this between different like public cloud providers if they have missed the virtualization support. So that's quite useful. That thing, well, we just ran a Minecraft server. I guess that's fixed. So we can move a running application while it's computing between things. That also works. And the desktop demo, um, the same, same thing. As long as it's network transparent, you're able to migrate it from A to B without issues. That avatar thing where you move an application from your phone to your computer is certainly possible. And of course, moving your stateful services closer to the user, well, that's what we just did with that Minecraft demo, for example. And again, I'm, if anyone's interested, I can demo the Redis thing later. Just now that we have an internet connection that actually does this. So yeah, if you guys are more interested in some more information on this, there's an entire research paper on this. It's 130 pages that just goes into every single detail you can possibly imagine about this. And it's all over, over GitHub. It's been peer reviewed, I think, a month ago at this point. And so if you're interested in this, just feel free to check it out. And all of the benchmarks, by the way, I mentioned with the like, latency and so on, all open source. So yeah. 
And not just the paper itself is open source. The library remap, well, that's open source. Um, of course, as well. The NBD server is also, also open source. So if you want, just want to use an NBD server or build parts of this, also possible. Architect, the actual migration, um, the orchestrator, is also open source on the Lupo Labs GitHub account. And the Firecracker fork that we mentioned, although it's, again, it's very minimal, is also open source. So yeah, and of course, um, Again, uh, just come talk to us. We're going to be moving all around the conference. Actually, there are three people right here in front that, in case you're as interested, um, can just talk to you about it. Um, we wear hats, so <laughs> you'll probably be able to find us pretty quickly. So um, yeah, and again, if you want to find out on social media, that's my, my information. And also, if you want more information, feel free to join the Lupo Labs Discord at lupolabs.io uh, slash Discord. And with that, I thank you. <laughs>